Well, first of all, it is so good to see so many people here. Um, Paul Wesling and IEEE are so glad to see all of you guys coming out to learn more about entrepreneurship and Silicon Valley. So my name is Annalise Cho, and I'm the president of IEEE Student Branch at UC Davis. I'm now going to give the floor to Chancellor Gary May. Chancellor May has known Paul since 1991, both at Georgia Tech and when Paul was Publications Vice President for the IEEE Electronics Packaging Society. Dr. May and his students worked with both Gail and Paul over the years. Let's give it up for Chancellor May. Thank you, Annalise. I actually thought it was 20 years, but now I learned it was 30 years that I've known Paul and Gail. <laughs> Um, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, you know, I enjoy coming to these meetings, especially because I don't know if all the students know I'm an, actually an electrical engineer, so I feel like you're my peeps. So uh, <laughs> feel very comfortable here, and I want to thank IEEE Student Branch for hosting today's event. I also want to thank all the campus leaders who are present uh, to support the IEEE Student Chapter. I'll just ask them to kind of wave as I mention them. Um, these include uh, College of Engineering Dean Richard Corsi. Richard Corsi, Dean Ra Unova from the Graduate School of Management, Dean Unova. Um, John, Justin Siegel, Faculty Director of the Innovation Institute for Food and Health, Justin. Uh, uh, Matt Traxler and Angela Taylor from the Quarter Aggie Square Program, or up there in the back. Okay, thank you for coming. And uh, also uh, Aaron Anderson, Director of the Student Startup Center. Aaron. So um, you're in for a treat today, I think. Um, as Annalise mentioned, Paul and Gail uh, uh, are old friends of mine, and today's lecture from Paul is titled uh, Characteristics of Successful Tech Hubs and Startups, Lessons from the Origin and Growth of Silicon Valley. Uh, I know you'll find this topic compelling and relevant to so much that we're doing here at UC Davis to build a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship, and that's one of our strategic plan goals, actually. Uh, UC Davis is a great place to study engineering. Uh, we're in a region where engineers are and will continue to be in very high demand. Uh, Davis graduates are really filling a pipeline in the workforce uh, uh, for the talent that's needed in engineering and software development and biotechnology from Silicon Valley to, to everywhere else in the country where those topics are, are important. Uh, we're creating new spaces where innovation and entrepreneurship can thrive. College of Engineering has developed an innovation ecosystem with numerous design clinics and programs. And this includes the Student Startup Center, which serves all UC Davis students, not just the engineers. We're also building Aggie Square in, in Sacramento. Aggie Square is our ultimate innovation ecosystem. It'll be part laboratory, workplace, business incubator, and community gathering space. This is where our companies, researchers, students, faculty, and community advocates will work side by side, and where cutting edge UC Davis research will power innovative new companies. It also houses our new uh, immersive learning program quarter at Aggie Square, uh, which I mentioned uh, just a few seconds ago. Food science will be one integral part of Aggie Square. Uh, we've already announced a collaboration with culinary icon Alice Waters. Uh, this uh, will leverage our strengths in agricultural research. Uh, by the way, the recent QS World University rankings place UC Davis at the top once again in this field, number one in the nation, number two in the world. Uh, I also want to mention our role, uh, the role of our UC Davis Graduate School of Management, uh, and thank Dean Unaba for being here. Um, UC Davis has one of the top 50 business programs in the nation and rising, as I've seen the latest rankings. Uh, we are developing the entrepreneurs and managers of the future, and importantly, we focus on collaborative uh, leadership and fostering inclusion, and the, the idea that business can be both good and responsible and profitable. Uh, <laughs> So there's never been a better time to be at UC Davis. Uh, the university is entering its most exciting chapter uh, yet, and you are all part of this great story. You, you're going to be the next generation of engineers and computer scientists and innovators and leaders and, and, uh, that the world needs. Uh, now, why I'm actually here, my pleasure to introduce uh, my friend Paul Wessling. Paul received a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and a master's degree in material science um, from Stanford University. I think I've heard of that place. Um, <laughs> his career in Silicon Valley included uh, working as an engineer, executive, resident, and an educator. He's worked for uh, GTE uh, Lenkert Electric, ISS Sperry Univac, Data Point Peripheral Products, and Tandem Computers, which is now part of Hewlett Packard. He designed several multi-chip module prototypes, managed Tandem's distinguished lecture series, and organized a number of advanced technology courses for his division and also for IEEE. After retiring from HP back in 2001, he served as Mr. IEEE for the San Francisco Bay Area for 10 years. 
Paul received the IEEE's Centennial Medal, uh, the Board's Distinguished Service Award, the Society Contribution Award, the IEEE's Third Millennium Medal, and the EPS Society's Professional, I'm sorry, Presidential Recognition Award. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to my friend Paul Wesley. Well, it's sure great to be here. This is a favorite topic of mine, and uh, innovation has been a key aspect of being able to um, watch Silicon Valley as it grew and developed into what we know today, which is quite a hub of technology. So we're going to explore that and look at where it came from, why it developed. I mean, it probably shouldn't have been here, but this is where it ended up, and this is where we're going to be taking a look at it. A classic Silicon Valley story that you probably have heard uh, over the last years is the uh, Wozniak Jobs Partnership. Uh, they called it Apple Computer. It started in a garage, which is how things are supposed to start. Uh, basically, it started at the Homebrew Computer Club in Menlo Park. They, they met up there about once every few weeks. Steve Wozniak designed this new computer that he called the Apple One. It was kind of neat because he could use a really cheap processor that uh, he could buy for 20 bucks instead of the $150 Motorola version, but it used the same chips as the Motorola version to support it, and he could write his own operating system. So he developed this mainly with the idea of showing his friends how to make one, uh, being able to help them along and learn how to, how to make it. And they got, he partnered with his uh, a neighbor, introduced him to Steve Jobs, and they partnered on this. And so uh, basically now that Apple company has the largest stock market capitalization in the world and is the most valuable brand in the world. So how could that happen? And more specifically, why in the San Francisco Bay Area? We're going to take a look at that, but I want to give you one more recent example. There were some immigrants, one from Ukraine, one from South Africa, one from Germany, and a bunch of others that started on the second floor of a Palo Alto bakery and founded PayPal. Some of them were students or graduate students or graduates of Stanford, names like Peter Thiel and Elon Musk and Reid Hoffman and so on. They call them the PayPal Mafia. Peter Thiel started a company called Confinity, and uh, Elon Musk formed one called X.com, and they formed PayPal, but then Peter Thiel went on to found his uh, Thiel Capital Management and Palantir, a large company that we may be familiar with. Maybe more important, he was the first outside investor of Facebook, uh, which turned out to be a pretty good company. Elon Musk went on to form SolarCity, and then Tesla and SpaceX were used to them launching satellites and so on, and the Boring Company. Peter Thiel formed something called SocialNet, but it was 10 years too early. Uh, Facebook really took that spot, but he had the first idea on it, and then went on to head up LinkedIn for many years until it was sold to Microsoft, and now he has a new company called Inflection.ai. So the questions we have are, how does this happen in Silicon Valley? And some of the points I'm going to cover include competition, obviously, but cooperation also. The hobby-focused nature of a lot of what happens, these small dynamic companies of which 80% fail, of course, but the other 20% do pretty well. The favorable California legal framework, I'll touch on that. And the great universities that are willing to engage with the projects of their students, as uh, Chancellor May just mentioned and large pools of entrepreneurs and technologists. So let's take a look at this. Silicon Valley was known as the Valley of Heart's Delight back in the early days, or before 1900, and this was more typically our product. It was cherries and prunes and uh, other kinds of fruit, apricots. And Leland Stanford said back in the 1800s, he said, Someday you will see Palo Alto blooming with nearly all the flowers of the earth and the fruit and shade trees of every zone. In the future, we shall can this fruit and send it all over the globe in exchange for wealth, which they did. But turns out that technology overtook agriculture at some point and became our chief export. So I'm going to go back to the very early days, back to 1909, and a company called Federal Telegraph. It was formed by a Palo Alto student, Cyril Elwell. Um, he hired Lee DeForest. Us electrical engineers recognized the name Lee DeForest. He was the inventor of the vacuum tube, the Audion, in uh, 1907. 
And while he was in Palo Alto, he also invented and patented the oscillator and the amplifier circuits, which became very important for radio and other technology. Cyril Elwell went to Denmark and licensed the rights to the pulse and arc transmitter, which we see on the right, and he raised funds from what today we would call angel investors, including David Starr Jordan, the president of Stanford, and uh, Roland Marx, the civil engineering professor, and John Casper Branner in geology, about $500 from each, which would be like $20,000 today, kind of two months' worth of salary. And with that, he was able to optimize this, and he demonstrated clear uh, and reliable communication between the West Coast and Hawaii for the first time. So here we have what I would think of as the first indications of venture capital and the involvement of a university with their students in helping them develop and um, nurture these companies. Federal Telegraph then in the 1920s put in three high power stations in Portland and San Francisco and near Los Angeles to support maritime shipping across the Pacific Ocean. They could reach almost all the way across and they would handle communication between the ship and shore and back and forth. And there's a, there's a plaque in Palo Alto that commemorates this. Another example, an early root uh, of entrepreneurial technology was Otis Moorhead. He was a graduate of Stanford, and he was a radio entrepreneur, and he developed his own company, Moorhead Laboratories, in San Francisco to make vacuum tubes. They were becoming somewhat manufacturable at that point. Now, you can make a few hundred, perhaps, without getting noticed, but if you start making a few thousand, somebody who holds those patents might notice what you're doing, and that's what happened the East Coast companies that controlled the patents filed an infringement lawsuit and shut him down in the early 1920s. So this idea of intellectual property is going to be a key aspect that we're going to examine in this talk. Some of the defining events, there was a lot of independent wealth from the uh, gold rush. The Titanic sinking in 1912 was a big event. It, re it reminded people, it emphasized to them that this technology of radio is going to be very important for ship safety and ship-to-shore communication. And World War I emphasized that also, the importance of technology. The Navy pushed on their ship-to-shore capability and communication between ships. But also the economics were important because instead of having to lay cable under the ocean or run lots of wires across the country, you could maybe just jump from Pittsburgh to Cleveland or something with radio and not have to have all this other infrastructure. So it made a lot of sense. And it brought a lot of funding to the San Francisco Bay Area, which was developing some of this technology. We're going to follow three early pioneers, Bill, El Bill Itell, Jack McCullough, and Charlie Litton. They came from Bay Area families. They were born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area. Here we see Charles Litton at 11 years old outside what he calls his wireless house. And here he is at about um, in 1915 experimenting with radio. He's got a little radio set up there, and he's uh, discovering how all this stuff works. Bill Itell took shop classes at Los Gatos High School, and then he worked in his father's quarry uh, up in the Santa Cruz Mountains where he became a machine operator and learned how to fix stuff. And then in the summer, he would work at his uncle's company, the Hall Scott Motor Car Company, uh, up in Oakland, uh, developing fixtures for machinery and running it. So he had quite, as a high school kid, had quite a bit of information and knowledge of how machines worked. Jack McCullough and Charlie Litton went to a special school, the California School of Mechanical Arts. It was opened in 1895 by uh, James Lick, who um, had the big uh, observatory above uh, San Jose. And it was to provide free education for boys and girls. This is a high school, to give them a rigorous training in the mechanical arts. And Lytton said he got a realistic feel for materials and processes as a high school student in these lab courses at the California School of Mechanical Arts. So, so after that, McCullough continued at a local junior college, and Lytton enrolled in Stanford's mechanical engineering department because there was no electrical engineering department. What you would do is you would go in chemical engineering or mechanical engineering, and then for your graduate work, you could focus on electrical, which might be propulsion for transportation or generation or transmission, the different parts of electrical engineering. And he got his bachelor's degree in 1924, and he took Stanford's first course in communication engineering fundamentals the next year, and he was hooked. Well, all of them were introduced to what we call ham radio, 1910s and 1920s. That was a hot business, and it was very uh, prevalent in the San Francisco Bay Area. It was an isolated seaport. wasn't near anything, really, connected by railroad, but that was about it. 
But there were a lot of shipping companies out of San Francisco, across the Pacific, the dollar shipping line and different shipping companies. But when they started licensing amateurs in the 1920s, it turned out there were about 1,200 in the San Francisco Bay Area, which today we would look back and say that was quite a bubble. Something is happening here. But they didn't have the statistical analysis we have today. So something was going on. The Bay Area was a center for radio production in the 1910s and 1920s, and a number of firms. Magnavox, we still see that name today. It was started up in Napa Valley and moved to Oakland. Heinz and Kaufman developed radio equipment, what we call HF radio equipment. Federal Telegraph that I mentioned produced radio transmitters up to a million watts. They had them in the Canal Zone and in Spain and across the Pacific. The U.S. Navy had it, had a number of them in Arlington, Virginia, and so on that could uh, bring uh, messages back and forth around the world. But one of the nice things was there were a lot of radio parts available for hobbyists. So if you were a high school kid or a college kid playing with this stuff, there were parts available that you could wind yourself a new coil or maybe get a vacuum tube and make a new transmitter. Also, there were jobs available for radio amateurs because the steamship lines needed engineers to run their radio rooms. So there were jobs there and, of course, on the shore also. Ham radio is a subculture with a lot of sociability. It's a, a way to get to know other people. It's a lot of fun. Um, you can communicate over the air, but also face-to-face. -face. We have uh, get-togethers, get ham conventions, and things like that. And in those days, they were very popular. But it's also very egalitarian. There's little heed to distinction by class or education. Uh, for example, Bill Eitel said in the, when he was heading up to Santa Clara County Radio Club, we had farm boys and Stanford students and Federal Telegraph technicians and retired executives all working in this hobby, trying to find better ways to do things or training new people and things like that. Well, one of the things that was about radio, and now you see it in the Internet and other things, is this building your own personal reputation uh, by making an improvement and showing people how it's done. So first of all, you want to find something neat and new that's the competition part, making something better. And then the camaraderie or the collaboration part is showing other people how to do it. As I mentioned with Steve Wozniak, he didn't want to sell those computers. He wanted to show other people how to make that board, build it up, put the operating system, run a tape drive, things like that. He wanted to show other people. That was the cooperation part. So it was a lot like this homebrew computer club and a lot like what happens in Silicon Valley today, a lot of network and sharing. Another pioneer was young Fred Terman. His father, for health reasons, uh, went to Los Angeles and started uh, teaching at Los Angeles Normal School, which today we call UCLA. Uh, and then he got hired away to go up to Stanford. And he headed up the education department there. This is 1910 or 1908, 1910. Herbert Hoover, who was a graduate of Stanford, had made his fortune in mining in China and Indonesia and places like that. And he was back, came back to the campus, and he rented a house across the street from the Termans. And so these kids, these high school kids, Herbert Hoover Jr., uh, Roland Marks, the son of the civil engineering professor, George Branner, Jack Franklin was the son of the chemistry uh, professor, all got together as teenagers and worked together. And Herbert Hoover, Hoover Jr. Uh, said, all three of us were neighbors, and upon pushing the key of one of our imposing contraptions, would holler out the window to see if it had been received on the other side of the street. So they're working back and forth as hobbyists, much as kids would do today in building websites or, or things like that. Well, young Fred Terman said if you saw a 90-foot pole sticking up somewhere, you'd go and knock on the door and get acquainted with him, because obviously this is a radio guy, and maybe you could play with his gear, or he's got something to show you. And then, as a high school kid, he hung out at Federal Telegraph, which was a half a mile or so down um, El Camino from Stanford. And he worked there one summer with Federal Telegraph. So that's another tie back to that first electronics company. And here's a picture of Fred Terman at 17 with his ham radio setup. We're going to follow these hobbyists. So Itel, Litton, and McCullough were ham friends. And they experimented with vacuum tubes. They built their own parts. I remember when I was a kid, I could take an old oatmeal box and wind a coil on there for an inductor for my radio. We built a lot of stuff ourselves back in those days. But they made notable contributions. For example, in 1924, Lytton, uh, operating the Stanford Radio Club, made the first radio contact across the Pacific to Australia and New Zealand. And in 1928, ITEL pioneered the 30 megahertz band, what we call 10 meters, 
uh, for transcontinental communication. This wasn't realized before you could do that sort of stuff. Lytton got a job through a ham friend at Federal Telegraph, and it built up to about eight, 60 engineers, and it was the sole supplier of radios, radio gear, for international telephone and telegraph. Emphasis on international. We're going to come back to that. ITIL got a job through a ham friend at Heinz and Kaufman, another company I had mentioned. Heinz himself was a ham, and they built high-end, uh, high-frequency radio equipment, and they recruited McCullough a year later to join it. And here's where Federal Telegraph was at the old Perham House, and then Lee DeForest had this building over here with his technicians where he did his work. Well, the tube business in those days was quite interesting. General Electric was a, big, a biggie in there. Westinghouse and AT&T were also involved, but they were all East Coast companies, and they developed high-power transmitting tubes in the early 1920s. But they were difficult to produce. It's hard to make reliable ones, get a good vacuum seal in there so it'll last a long time, uh, required precise machining, blowing of glass. This was Pyrex glass, exotic materials, uh, sealing techniques. It was touchy in those days. But important to our people was you couldn't buy these transmitting tubes on the open market. The Navy and General Electric, after World War I, decided they wanted to keep this technology in the United States. And so they developed a company called Radio Corporation of America, or RCA, to hold all these patents. And they licensed then just the companies they wanted to, the U.S. companies, such as uh, GE, Western Electric, which is AT&T, and Westinghouse. So they had this cross-licensing of these patents, and they were the sole producers of these tubes. But they wouldn't sell them to the Bay Area tubes because we were making radios, international telephone and telegraph. So they went into Spain and China and different parts of the world, and the U.S. wanted to control the technology. And they saw us a, th a threat. So both companies needed to develop their own triode tubes, and so Lytton headed up one, and ITEL headed up the other one. So they're competitors, you'd think? Well, they had to, the tough part was to design around these RCA patents so they didn't get shut down like Morehouse did, which was a very difficult task. They hired a number of local people. They collaborated with each other, which you didn't do in those days typically, but that's a Silicon Valley trait is when you're small and struggling, you work with other people. And they based out on the friendships they had over the years. They also worked closely with their patent attorneys because first, they didn't want to infringe the RCA patents and get sued. But second, they wanted to, to control the technology they did develop and file patents to control that. So they set up their tube shops. Uh, Heinz, Eintel, Eintel, and McCullough engineered a rugged new power tube with new materials that didn't infringe the patents, better shock-resistant seals for reliability, better vacuums. Charlie didn't develop the oil vacuum pump, which would give them a much higher vacuum and much better repeatability and reliability. And so it was nice. They were longer lived than the RCA tubes, but one of the key things was they didn't infringe RCA's patents. Very key point. And Lytton then, he was our uh, process guy really, invented the glass lathe, which you see in the lower right, uh, for assembling glass blowing and sealing these on a single axis. If you've ever run a lathe, they're great for making things that uh, rotate on a single axis. So he could build the tube in there, seal it all up without moving it. So it was highly repeatable, very precision operation, and they got much better, more uh, consistent tubes. And he built the tube shop on his parents' property, so we sort of say that's a garage and it qualifies as a Silicon Valley startup. Now it's the 1930s and we're into the U.S. Depression Heinz and Kaufman closed down, so I tell them a color form, their own company, which us ham radios uh, lovingly call IMAC, uh, and that, to build high power, high frequency tubes, primarily focused on that ham radio hobby group, the people that had those useless frequencies up at the high end that the hobbyists could play with. And they got some financing. Harrison was a real estate agent in San Bruno, and he kicked in $20,000, and Preddy ran some movie theaters in San Francisco, and he put in 20000 So with that, they got 50% of the company, and I tell them McCullough got the other 50%. So here we have them sharing ownership. You might say that's the first uh, precursor of uh, what we see up, up in Menlo Park on Sand Hill Road, venture capital uh, buying in. Um, Harrison then sold his interest before World War II for about 80000 
and Prey held onto his until after World War II and sold it for about 150000 So they made some money on this. It was an investment, a venture capital investment. The point is that they all cooperated closely, and Lytton uh, helped set up IMAX vacuum tube shop in the early, early 1930s. He gave them a couple of vacuum lathes and some uh, castings, plus he gave them the drawings. He says, make some of these. This is how you make tubes well. And so they freely exchanged technical and commercial information to reduce risks. Because remember, most Silicon Valley companies are real small. They're focused in a certain area, and they depend on these other companies and resources around them to uh, make it, make a go of it. Much like Jobs and Wozniak and the Homebrew Computer Club. Well, in the Depression, Federal Telegraph, finally in the, in the late 1920s, donated some transmitters to Stanford for the radio lab. And then the company was sold and moved back east. But there was a big leftover magnet. You can see this big magnet pole piece here. Leonard Fuller, who was the chief engineer, got a hold of Ernest Lawrence over at UC Berkeley and said, what could you do with a big magnet like this? So uh, Lawrence built his 42-inch cyclotron and uh, developed high-energy physics research there at UC Berkeley, which developed into six Nobel Prizes by 1960. So again, that technology had other uses which were very useful. The magnet was just sitting out in Palo Alto rusting, so that was a good use for it. In 1936, Fred Terman asked Charlie Litton to join the Stanford Double E Department as a lecturer to help out, share knowledge with the staff and students, uh, help them understand lab uh, instrumentation. And as part of a Klystron grant, uh, Litton got uh, about $1,000, and he says, well, I don't really need that. Give it to Fred Terman. So Fred uh, got a hold of one of his students that had graduated the year before, back on the East Coast. He had a job at GE. And he said, uh, David, why don't you come back to campus? You and Lucille can come. You can use $500 for, to live on and the other $500 for equipment, and you can work on your master's degree. So David Packard came back to the campus, met with Bill Hewlett, who was working on his graduate degree. He had developed a neat circuit for an audio oscillator. Uh, and they formed Hewlett Packard. Again, that was in a garage. So here again we see this university industry cooperation, the grad students, the graduated students, working with university faculty and staff. In the late 1930s, there's a threat to peace uh, from Japan and Germany. President Roosevelt is rebuilding the Army and Navy, and there's a new electronic system called radio detection and ranging called radar. And the idea is you take this signal and you pop it out, and it goes and it bounces off something and comes back, and you say, oh, that's 18 miles. I can tell by the delay, and I can tell something about it, but the frequencies of those days were very low, and you could sort of tell there was something there, but not much about it, not much definition. What they needed was higher voltage, higher frequency transmitting tubes, so they could narrow that image down and figure out if it's a, a bomber or a plane or what it is. And only IMAX tubes worked best at those high voltages and frequencies because they were developed for ham radio operators who were using those useless frequencies up there. So the Klystron was developed by a couple of Palo Alto kids, uh, Russ and Sig Varian. They worried about Germany. They hoped that maybe they could use microwaves to detect these planes, little tiny waves that they could get good definition on them. And in 1937, Russ moved to Stanford's lab to work with Bill Hansen, the physicist, uh, and they developed the Klystron in 1937, using Lytton's free advice about how you could maybe make these things. And then uh, Russ would come in and talk to Bill Hansen and say, here's what I want to do, whatever. And Bill would say, well, that won't work, but try this. So he'd come back a month later with new ideas. And over a period of a year, year and a half, they developed the Klystron. And uh, so it used Hansen's theoretical assistance. And here's about a 30-kilowatt Klystron. I call it the first integrated circuit because it's a bunch of antennas and tuned cavities and things. But they didn't know what integrated circuits were in those days. Probably only in the Palo Alto newspaper will you see this. First of all, here's our president uh, talking about this danger from this war in Europe. And this guy, Adolf Hitler, talking about, I just want one more country. Give me Czechoslovakia and I'll stop. Okay, so just leave, leave us alone. I guess we're hearing that today in Ukraine. But anyway, the key headline, headline here is New Stanford Radio Invention Heralds Revolutionary Changes. And here's uh, Sigurd and Russell Varian on the front page of the newspaper in 1939. So there's a big wartime expansion as uh, investment money comes into this. Uh, Stanford becomes a hotbed of microwave 
uh, development. There was also quite a progressive approach to business, very egalitarian, open-door policy. I could go in, the president at Tandem Computers was Jimmy Tribig. I could go into his office and put my feet up on his desk and say, Jimmy, we got a problem. So it was open, very open communication, not structured like we tended to see in the East Coast companies. Also, the managerial techniques they used tended to thwart union organization, kept employees happy and productive. For example, they had profit sharing. You could go back to school and they would pay your tuition if you got an A or a B. Kaiser developed cafeterias so their work people didn't have to bring their lunch or go home for lunch. And medical clinics, the Kaiser Permanente Hospital System grew out of uh, the, the wartime ship construction in the Bay Area. And we had the HP Way philosophy, something you can dig into in more detail about how they felt companies should be run. And that tends to be true of technology companies like Hewlett Packard, Fairchild, Intel. I worked at Tandem for, for 17 years. And one of the rules, I remember we, the first week we learned some rules. And one of the rules, rules I remember was when you're in a meeting and somebody comes up with a new idea, you can't say anything bad about it for five minutes. You can only say, yeah, that could work. Maybe marketing could do this and we could try this in the design. But if you say, that's a dumb idea, you're not going to get very many new ideas popping up in new meetings. So if you want innovation in your company, a rule like that really helps. You re remember, I've got to stop for five minutes and see if I can make this fit into our product plan. One of many ideas you get from Silicon Valley. After the war, there was a big realignment. RCA focused on TV and broadcasting, formed the National Broadcasting Corporation, or NBC. We still see that around in Comcast, and there's pieces of that. iMac went on to develop better tubes for ham radio people, of course. Uh, the FCC started a new radio service called Frequency Modulation, or FM radio, and they did a surprise. Instead of putting it at 50 megahertz, they put it up at 100 megahertz, which is where you're used to it, 88 to 108. But RCA found that their tubes didn't work at that frequency. So they did the next best thing. They copied the iMac tube, which did work. I think you can see where this is going. So there was a big reversal of fortunes. In 1947, iMac sued RCA and GE for patent infringement and shut them down. And those became distributors of iMac tubes, or makers of licensed products from iMac. So the big dog then became Silicon Valley. In, uh, in high power, high frequency tubes. After the war, Charlie Litton went on with this Playstron thing for physics research, for linear accelerators that were developed at Stanford, and he increased the power from 30 kilowatts up to 30 megawatts, great big huge tubes, which transformed Stanford into a major player. And here's the two mile long linear accelerator used for research, and if, uh, you, if anybody gets uh, cancer radiation therapy, they're using a uh, Litton Claystron in there to generate that energy. Another example of this cooperation, uh, Varian Associates uh, and was developing microwave equipment, and they had some microwave test equipment they used. They built a number of them, but they didn't really want to go into production for this. So they said to HP, give us $20,000. We'll license this thing to you and show you how to make it, and you can make this equipment this microwave test equipment. So they enlarged their product line and revenues in the 1950s and developed divisions in Santa Rosa and Santa Clara, which became Agilent, which at the time was the largest IPO in history. Now it's known as Keysight. Uh, Dave and Bill uh, took Varian up on this, uh, got that product, and ma made a whole new product line for measurement equipment. Here's a mural that's up in Palo Alto. You can actually visit it. Uh, it shows schematically what happened around Stanford. Here's Ernest Lawrence. Here's that big magnet I told you about, and Leonard Fuller uh, giving him the magnet. And over here you see Lee DeForest with his, uh, his tube right here. Um, here's Charlie Litton with his glass lathe, making tubes on his glass lathe. Fred Terman and um, Bill Hewlett and David Packard here at the desk. Philo Farnsworth developed the first all-electronic TV tube up in San Carlos, I think. So. Here you have kind of a summary of what was going on in those early years. And it's actually a mural. You can see it's in an office. Here are some cubicles, so you can walk in there if they're open. And if you're quiet, you can take a picture. Then in the late 40s, Bill Shockley, who had grown up in Palo Alto, here he is with his uh, dog sitting out in front of his house. 
and he went to school at Caltech, graduated from MIT with his doctorate, and invented the, the uh, transistor at Bell Labs, and then uh, got the Nobel Prize in 1956 for doing that. And the idea was to reduce the huge power draw these tubes have, be able to use something solid state that didn't have that problem. Well, he left the East Coast, went back to Caltech to teach for a year or so, and Arnold Beckman said, hey, I'll, I'll help you start up your transistor company. I'll provide the funding, and you can locate it right here in Culver City. And Bill Shockley says, hmm, Culver City, I don't think so, because his mother still lived up, lived up at Stanford, and so he started up in Mountain View next to Stanford. And, and a couple years later, the traders ate, left to form Fairchild with real venture capital funding, and that kind of kicked off the whole thing. The planar process was a key part of that. It was developed by Jean Hernet. Uh, so they could make diffused transistors, make them in a single plane instead of making them and cutting the edges. And what did it require? High vacuum technology. Charlie Litton was an expert in that. Precise furnaces, we knew how to do that. Uh, glass blowing and quartz machining, expert machinists for that. Uh, ultra pure gas and water, process control, continuous improvement. Those are kind of signatures of these small companies were happening in the Bay Area. So this built on top of the capabilities developed in the previous three or four decades. So it made sense that the planar process and transistors and integrated circuits would happen then in, in uh, the Bay Area. And Isaac Asimov, the uh, science fiction writer, said about the planar process, he said, it's the most important moment since man emerged as a life form, which maybe is a little exaggeration, but you've got a billion transistors in your cell phone, I mean, how do you get them all in there? It's, it's a challenge. So this has happened because of that planar process. That's the process that's used around the world to make ICs. So at the end, the situation had changed dramatically. Instead of being a backwater, handling uh, mercantile uh, shipping, it became a high-tech hub. And the peninsula and the valley were major electronic centers. Um, they developed tubes there, then semiconductors, ICs. About half the microwave tubes were still made there in the 1960s. They were in every advanced weapon system and space system and a wide range of industrial goods. Silicon Valley turned out to be central to the defense effort and also the manufacturing economy for the commercial uh, part of the business. And why did that happen? Now we're going to look at kind of summarizing some of these ideas. First of all, the business climate. On the East Coast, they had large vertically integrated firms, so you would develop the materials, develop the sub-assemblies, develop the whole thing, and basically you had the whole product there. Uh, they were slow to adjust to new technologies because they had all this old technology to haul around behind them. Uh, Silicon Valley, on the other hand, was decentralized, very fragmented, little tiny companies that come and go. Some of them grow, most of them don't. Uh, very specialized firms, typically engineering driven, so we see companies trying to make something better. They, there's this dense network that we had developed of uh, small and medium-sized firms that support this new technology company you're starting. And California, in 1873, passed a law saying they would not enforce non-compete clauses. So if you're in New York and you join a company, you sign an agreement saying you won't compete with the company for one year after you leave. So you're a top technologist at this company. Do you think the little startup next door is going to hire you? No, they're going to get a lawsuit against them. You can't work for them for a year. California won't enforce those. So although the company might sue you for leaving and joining a competitor, it will be thrown out by the courts. So it's really nice. I can start up a company and go to Google or Meta or someplace and say, would you like to work for me? And say, sure. Well, they can start right away. That you can't take the company's proprietary information or customer lists, but you can take your knowledge and start working right away. This is unique to only five states in the union. So it's a very great advantage for California. That's why most companies, most startup companies will come to California, even if they're in France or someplace else, for some years to develop their product. So it allows us to change things more rapidly. And the companies we had thrived in that new environment. So. These practices, skills, and competencies were developed over the last hundred years. I talked about analog and a little about digital, but we also found it was true in software and biotech. The first biotech company was, was Genentech in South San Francisco with venture capital from Kleiner Perkins. Uh, mobile, 
big data, deep learning, uh, virtual and augmented reality, autonomous vehicles. It's all happening here. So we see a large number of entrepreneurs plus the engineers and venture capitalists needed to support these efforts. Local universities with search and development going on, but also working with their graduates, working as consultants, working as board members for these small companies. We also have role models. So our high school kids grew up thinking, yeah, you can start your own company or join your friends in doing that. There's high expectations. It's this culture of innovation that's kind of taken over all, well, pretty much all of Northern California. So in the 40s and 50s, we had Shockley. I mentioned Shockley Transistor. So I've got a question for you. A lot of you probably have an Apple iPhone. So the intelligent agent there is called Siri. Why is it called Siri? It's because SRI is just too hard to pronounce. The two engineers that developed that worked at SRI. They left and started their own company. They just left it called, called Siri. And when Apple bought that little company, they kept the same name. So that's why it's called Siri. A good way to remember Stanford research, Hewlett Packard and so on, and the universities, Berkeley and Stanford. Uh, and then in the 60s, we have semiconductor companies, advanced micro devices, national semiconductor, Intel, Intersil. In the 1970s, we now have actual computer companies, Tandem Computers, Apple, Amdahl Corporation. Uh, we have video games, Atari, and so on. I mentioned Genentech. Stanford and UC San Francisco have split about $300 million over the last 30 years based on that recombinant DNA patent that they uh, had on that technology. 1980s, we get real software companies. So Adobe has made this great uh, graphics editing program for the Macintosh. We also have routing companies. Cisco is starting to build out Ethernet and build out the, uh, the in what becomes the Internet. We have high-end workstations from... Uh, Silicon Graphics, Sun Microsystems, MIPS. And then in the 90s and beyond, we had companies like I mentioned Tesla earlier, Netscape. A lot of the companies that we see today, Salesforce, Netflix, Pandora, that are developing on this earlier technology developed by people that uh, grew up on that technology and then started their own. And I mentioned the automotive area. All of the major companies have big labs there. Ford has a big outfit with four, four or 500 engineers in the Sanford Business Park. GM bought Cruise Automation in San Francisco, about 5,000 people. VW, BMW. Um, here's an interesting case, Samsung. So you've got a small company, and, and Samsung makes washing machines and smartphones and all kinds of products, and they've got a lot of software that goes into those. They also have operating systems. So they buy your little software company of nine people. They say, would you like to move to South Korea? And you say, hmm, I don't think so. And so they built a 10-story building in Santa Clara. And so they say, okay, you guys are in the north wing on the second floor, and those guys are in the south wing on the fourth floor. And it becomes a, basically an incubator. It's filling up. It's probably more than half full now. These little companies that Samsung buys to do the advanced development on their products. And there's this Arkansas grocery store company, and for about the last 25 years, their development labs have been on the peninsula near the airport. So a lot of the technology for these large companies happens first in the San Francisco Bay Area. But where is Silicon Valley exactly? Um, if you look on a map, it said Silicon Valley is hmm, about there, near Palo Alto and Mountain View. But really, it's a metaphysical space. It extends from Santa Cruz to Livermore, probably to Davis now. You're starting to see that sneaking in here where companies say it's too expensive. I'm going to start, you know, in Vacaville or Davis or something. So it's becoming a space that probably includes you. You may find that you're going to be running into some of these same kinds of companies and environments here. Venture capital funding. The Bay Area has most of it. Uh, back in the uh, 2014, when I took the snapshot, it was 55%. Now it's about 40%, but it's still the largest chunk. New England, 10%. New York, 10%. Uh, Austin, you know, 3 5%. So there's pieces all over, but the ch large chunk of it is still here, happening here in Silicon Valley. So how different are we? It's a bottoms-up approach instead of a top-down approach that you tend to see in some companies that try to develop technology. I like to think it's our attitude here in Silicon Valley, where we think of failure as a feature, not a bug. So if something failed, it's telling you something, but it's a feature. Go ahead and either optimize it, work around it, whatever. 
Uh, also, one of the companies had a motto called move fast and break things. But Yoda said, do or do not. There is no try. So we have this 100% commitment. When you start it with your friends, you're committed to doing it. You're going to make sure it happens. So some of the characteristics I promised to spend a little time on, what, what is it like to have a tech hub or work in a tech hub, and what are these startups like? First of all, as you saw, I mentioned it's competition and cooperation. So you're trying to make something better, doing your best, but then you're going to be networking, you're going to be cooperating. So when, um, when um, Steve Wozniak wanted some help, he called uh, Bill Hewlett and asked Bill for some help, and he got access to the uh, stock room at HP so he could get parts and things. So we find that it's a very cooperative environment for many of the companies there. It's often, as I mentioned earlier, hobby-focused. So you start up this thing with your friends or a few people you've met where you're working. We tend to have small, dynamic companies rather than large, structured companies. You read about the structured companies, Lockheed and Hewlett Packard and Google and so on, but it's the little companies you can't read about yet that you'll read about in maybe five or ten years. That's where the focus is. And so it's a work hard, play hard environment, avoiding vertical integration like the plague. You don't want to become, you don't want your supply chain to be inside your company. You want to buy from somewhere else. You want to in integrate this stuff. There's also a lot of fluidity, as I no noted. For example, you don't really uh, abandon something. We call it a pivot now, where you uh, decide that, oh, that's not going to work. Let's try this instead. So you find there's a lot of dynamics in this, a lot of discussion and a lot of development work there. If you fail and go out of business, you're recycling those people, those resources, into something new instead of holding on to them as a black hole for the next five years. Very egalitarian, as I mentioned. Uh, no dedicated parking places. If you're an officer of the company and you come in at 9 o'clock, you park in the far corner of the parking lot. Open door policy. When I was at Amdahl, we had a 10% time rule that said you should spend maybe 10% of your time on your own stuff. And so I was able to work as an IEEE officer uh, and go off to conferences and so on on their dime. And Google supports this also. They say you should spend 10 to 20% of your time working on your stuff. If it works out, maybe it'll become a product of ours. And if you want to leave and start it on your own, maybe our venture part would fund you for that. And we'll buy you back if it's successful. So it's this constant churning of ideas and so on, that this uh, taking this 10 or 20 percent time is good uh, for the company. We had a Friday beer bus. It was to meet other people around the company and share ideas and sit around the pool and talk to them about what they were doing in quality control or in marketing or whatever, get to know people. So every Friday at Tandem Computers, we had a beer bus. So it was a very focused uh, environment, focused on the employee. I mentioned Ready Venture Capital. Uh, the venture capital chart that I showed shows venture capital all over, but a lot of that's early stage and first round venture capital. It's hard in Columbus, Ohio to get second round venture capital, get the big chunks. A lot of that only happens around Silicon Valley. So you can start up, but you may end up having to move here in order to optimize that and get that next round. I mentioned the California uh, legal framework where they don't enforce non-compete clauses. It's a very big advantage to us in California. Uh, a number of great universities that encourage startups. Uh, one of the things that Fred Terman did when he retired as, as a provost at Stanford was to go back to New Jersey where they hired him to advise them, can we start up a Silicon Valley here? And he came to the conclusion, no, you couldn't. You've got, you don't have a good university. You've got Princeton, but... I mean, they're, they're a think tank. They, they don't help their students do things. Uh, you don't have the environment that you would have around a Stanford or a UC Berkeley or a UC Davis. So it was not something that could be done. And in fact, it did fail there in New Jersey. You have a lot of educated professionals. They like to come to places that are nice to live in, like Northern California, like the Bay Area. Uh, as we don't have as much snow as they have in uh, in Poughkeepsie, New York, or something like that. So they tend to be drawn here, and especially when the exciting jobs are here, when the people they want to associate with are here. So we find we have large pools of technologists to support the uh, entrepreneurs, and it's a network effect. Metcalfe's law kind of kicks in there, where the effect is proportional to, to the square of the, uh, the involvement. That's true in uh, the Internet, for example. Uh, it's hard to compete with Facebook anymore because... 
they're already big, and it goes as a square in the number of people that are subscribers. Well, that's true in, in this Northern California environment, too. Uh, once you have that flywheel going, this huge number of people involved, it makes it difficult to compete in another area. And so people from previous companies that have shut down or maybe been bought out, they're available for that next enterprise. As I mentioned with Reid Hoffman, after he sold LinkedIn to Microsoft, he's off starting his next company. And there are other management factors, but those are some of the big ones. And so those are what you should look to if you're looking at getting a job in a tech hub. Those are the kinds of things you want to see. And if you're doing your own startup, you want to look for these kinds of things. So there are a few issues. The cost of housing in the San Francisco Bay Area is astronomical. A quote here, high-tech clusters tend to be located in cities with high labor and real estate costs, like San Francisco, Boston, or Seattle. But that's maybe not a drawback because the pay is also high. We don't have enough educated technologists. We're always asking for more. Uh, jobs are still increasing there. They're not moving out. Uh, it's disruptive to business models. This is a challenge because you're putting big companies or even government out of business. So you're developing models that uh, cause grief for other people. Also, there's the issue of retraining displaced workers. If you're putting a, a particular bunch like taxi drivers out of business, you've got to worry about retraining them to do something else. And we don't do enough of that. These uh, shared economy workers, independent contractors. So there are a number of problems, too, which we can address in the Q&A, if you'd like. A few sources. There's a book called Making Silicon Valley that's good about showing what happened in those early days. And Lee uh, Saxanian's book compares Silicon Valley to Boston's Route 128, pluses and minuses. Why did they not succeed when they're so near... Harvard and MIT and so on. And she makes it very clear. Margaret O'Mara up at the uh, uh, University of Washington talks about Stanford versus University of Pennsylvania versus Georgia Tech, compares the environments, the working conditions, and so on, and tries to draw out how things work and why they work the way they do. Another good book for understanding Silicon Valley is Decoding Silicon Valley. And so I think that gives you a feeling for the understanding of why Silicon Valley is still a primary tech hub uh, and became the tech center for that technology development and probably will stay that way. And I point out that you can download the slides. And so with that, I'll thank you for sticking around for this and open it for questions. And there is a sense now that what is happening, the kind of innovation and focus mm -hmm. is much more driven by making profit. Right, so Apple's, you know, mm -hmm. or companies at the time, profitability was accidental, maybe mm -hmm. even needed to scale up, but it wasn't number one. Mm -hmm. Do you feel there has been a shift, and can, are there any particular things you would point to, mm -hmm. or factors? Is it Wall Street moving mm -hmm. here? Is it moving from hardware to software to information and services? You know, the kinds of innovations we see are... It's so different today. So there's a lot of focus on trying to make money in many companies. They're going to try to score big, uh, get an IPO, or, or get bought by somebody or whatever. But I think that the, the larger majority of the companies are started because I want to try to do this. And so I still think it's not the financial driver. It's the technology. It's the, it's the gee whiz environment that's driving it in autonomous vehicles, for example. And so you've got little companies in autonomous vehicles that start up and do things, you know they're not going to succeed. They're going to get bought or whatever because you've got these big companies that are already tying it up, General Motors and Cruise and, and Waymo and so on. But they're still doing it because they can, uh, because they've got this little niche that they want to do. And they'll probably get merged or bought or something. They're not going to become a billion-dollar, trillion-dollar company. But I think most of the drive is still the innovation part and the fact that I can do this, I think. I can do this. And you're going to have crash and burns. You're going to have Elizabeth Holmes. You're going to have all kinds of things going wrong. Apple pretty much went out of business and came back, uh, you know, second kind of a second coming or something. And they didn't have to succeed. When Steve Jobs went, went over to see uh, Xerox Park about, wow, what's this thing? Oh, it's a mouse. And, uh, you know, on a graphical display, it was a wide open thing for him. He just, but he adopted it. He says, my Macintosh is going to look like that. So we like to borrow ideas. The transistor wasn't invented here. It was invented at Bell Labs. But for $100, you could buy the rights to it. So 
we take those things and then reinvent on top of it. And so there certainly is a focus among the financial people and the venture capitalists to try to make some profit on it. But, of course, again, 80 90% of them go out of business. So they've got to make some big ones now and then. It's a, it's a mix. There's certainly a focus on trying to make some money on it, but I think the bigger focus is on Metcalf's Law, trying to grow it so that nobody can compete with you and you can bring this product to market. So I, I think you did, uh, there were some like really important points, and I'll, I'll just say again just so the, audience, so the students can hear them, I think particularly uh, the cooperation and specialization. Cooperation. I, in my experience, I, I couldn't emphasize that enough. And mm-hmm. the specialization, my, uh-huh. I'll steal a line from my dad, if, if any company is trying to perform two miracles, they're going to fail. One is enough. Goal. And so what you alluded to is I think you did a fantastic job going in and out and, 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 and discussing how What you alluded to a few times I think would be particularly helpful for the group in the room and think, you know, kind of off the cuff, your first mm-hmm. thoughts. Sure. Is you alluded to a few times the importance of that relationship between the university mm-hmm. and the the startup mm-hmm. environment. Yeah. So for our students, what what type of activities do you think are best done and engaged with at the university while they're in the university, and when do you leave a university and do things privately? Mm-hmm. So I mentioned that uh, uh, Charlie Litton came back to become a lecturer at Stanford and help those people and so on. And that's the kind of thing you see. I think those that get involved as maybe upper division students or grad students in projects on the campus and then can carry that off because software is developed here but not into products necessarily. But it may be technology or approaches or something that you'd like to work on. If you go nearby and start your own little company, you've still got links to that lab, to that professor, or to those students and so on. So that relationship is nice as opposed to graduating without any of that experience, that startup experience or that uh, intellectual property experience, you start something, you don't have those relationships anymore or yet. Uh, you have to develop them. So that networking is critical. I think that the idea of working and making your mistakes in a university lab is much better than trying to make them in a nine-month takeoff uh, period for your startup when you run out of money. So you get a chance to fail and restart, fail and restart, discover what it's like, discover how few resources you have inside yourself. You're good at many things, but you need other people to complement that on the business side, on the uh, biology side, whatever side it's on, you'll find that you'll need the skills of other people. And that can develop very nicely in the teamwork you get in a project at a university, for example. One thing that's been recently happening in the world of business is like you get the Amazon uh, unionization vote in New York. Mm -hmm. And so there's this like juxtaposition between, say, people who are uh, angry at Google, for example, Mm -hmm. uh, about a lot of the stuff that was going on there and these like, you know, benefits that a lot of people want to get out of joining a fan company. Mm -hmm. Um, So I guess the question is, uh, what do you think the future of uh, uh, management employee relationships will look like in the near Mm -hmm. future, say the next 10 to 20 years? So I think that in, in the technology companies, you're still going to find a lot of that egalitarian stuff. If we've got a product, we want to get it out there, maybe drop the price so that it's not real expensive, thinking of Lyft and Uber and so on. So you may not be giving a whole lot to the actual people who are doing the work. So you're talking about uh, Starbucks, for example, organizing their stores. And so there's going to be that dis- discord there. Um, ideally, they'll adapt and pay better if that's what the deal is. But also people like some control in their life. And if you're an Uber driver, you have very little control. You're bidding on jobs as they come up. And you've got to take this eight or 12 hour shift of your own choice. But maybe you want to just do it part time. Maybe you don't want, like California wants you to be an employee if you work for Uber. But you only want to work six hours a week on Sunday mornings. You can't do that as an employee. For example, I I get two newspapers delivered to my house. Remember what newspapers are? Um, two, every morning they get delivered. That's going to be illegal next year. They can only deliver one because they've got to work for one company or the other. So therefore, both co- companies now have to have their own deliverers driving those routes, and one person cannot deliver two newspapers. So that's, that's HR 5 or something. So Calif- California, governments tend, tend to be conservative in the sense they like things to stay the way they are. And that's always a challenge. And in California, we want always you should be an independent contractor with your own uh, business uh, and contracts, or you should be an employee. There's nothing in between in the legislator's mind. But there is. If you're an independent contractor using one of these apps to pick up jobs, 
California would like you to be an employee. So I'm, I'm going to lose two home-delivered newspapers. One of my favorite things is sitting in the morning with coffee, reading my newspaper. So maybe that's part of the sacrifice I have to make. But I'd rather have them discover there's a third model for working. And that may help uh, employees in different companies. Different states are different. Uh, New Jersey is very tight on non-compete clauses, for example. So I have done a lot of jobs for the IEEE, which is located in New Jersey. So they're very extremely worried that I'm going to represent myself as working for IEEE and that they'll have to pay me unemployment if I can't find a new contract because some of the court decisions there are still in that area. It's a challenge. You're always working with people, and although in our startup companies it's probably going to be very egalitarian, we've got to worry a little bit about the environment we set up across the country and around the world. Is it really going to help other people? You showed the map of market share uh, per state, and we've mm -hmm. seen a trend that is diminishing the amount of share uh, of Silicon Valley. And even like in the news right now, we've seen that Austin, Texas, or mm -hmm. Miami are booming as tech hubs. Even like Elon Musk, I think, is moving there. So I guess my question is, what do you think is the outlook for uh, Silicon Valley as mm -hmm. uh, the dominant tech hub? Good question. Yeah, definitely. Some headquarters are moving out of the state. I guess if I had to be taxed in this state, which I guess I do, I might think about moving out also. One of the questions is, is as companies, Hewlett Packard moved out, Tesla moved out, they're headquarters. But you notice most of the development work is still in this area, although they've got big labs in London and maybe in China and Austin. But basically, over the last couple of years, are people moving out? And I think some companies are, headquarters have. But uh, here's a study that came out in the Los Angeles Times a couple days ago. They, they reported on a study. Uh, are people really leaving Silicon Valley? Well, it turns out the tech hubs, which is Seattle, uh, Silicon Valley, um, Los Angeles, increased employment by 0.3%, which is less than about the 1.2% it typically has gone up in a year. But it's still going up. And then the rising star hubs like Austin and, and Columbus, Ohio, and Alabama and places, other places, is rising at a slower pace, 0.1%. And so there's an increased movement within metro areas, people moving out to Vacaville and Davis and so on. But not so much uh, companies actually leaving. Nevertheless, if you're a company, a fairly growing company in Silicon Valley, what you'll want to do is start your production pr uh, facility somewhere else or have another lab somewhere else. You may find that you find great resources in Switzerland or in uh, Germany or something. So you may start a, a division there. But you may find that either your main headquarters or a large chunk of your development is still going to stay in the Bay Area. And so I thought that was a very one. He said the California metropolises really do retain their irreplaceable depth and strength. It's this Metcalf's law of, uh, of having enough infrastructure and enough of a flywheel that other people find it hard to compete for the total startup environment. You know, I, I feel like we, we see a lot of entrepreneurs uh, who haven't necessarily went to university, and just personally, I, I think it's a, it's a little bit inefficient. Like, why, why can't you know, the free market come up with its own alternative? You do, uh, in some sense, uh, our university is kind of holding technology back. So there's a couple of parts that I'd like to address to that question. Um, the university is... It's not their job, of course, to create the new technology. Well, it's their job maybe to help create it, but not to optimize it for production. But also, that touches on another point. You hear about these kids like Bill Gates that drop out of Harvard or, or Zuck or somebody that leave the university early, or Elizabeth Holmes, that leave early and start their own company uh, and don't get a full education. Is that still a good model? And uh, probably not. It can happen. But I think that this is a good incubating environment for you because you're still wet behind the ears, you're young, most of you. If you're still young and learning, I think that liberal education combined with the technical education is a very good background for you. You don't end up getting uh, zeroed in on something that you don't, have, you don't have the broad picture. I think having that university background is good for the 98% that do that and then go into the technology. I think that's the better approach. <clears throat> and universities... Some universities are better than others at incubating these ideas, but I think most of the good research universities, like Davis, uh, are good at 
exploring the, 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 the corners of the technology, finding out what else can be done, what can be done in, in um, protein folding, for example. What, what don't we know so far? And you can pick up on that in the university environment. You've got to be open for it. You can't just zero in on your major and get take your classes and whatever. You've got to be open. Join the IEEE, as Annalise said, or, or your own uh, civil engineering or chemical engineering group and network so you have a better feeling for what's going on with other people. So it prepares you better to take advantage of what you're seeing that's specific to your university. I think that helps a lot. You were saying that uh, technology companies are disruptive and that you know, kind of mm-hmm. makes them a technology company and it gives them an edge when mm-hmm. they're disruptive. Mm-hmm. And I think that this year there's kind of been a disruptive financial technology that came out um, to make technologies uh, companies public mm-hmm. called Special Purpose Acquisition. Yeah, SPACs. Uh, mm-hmm. Blank check SPAC. Do you think this is a good thing or a bad thing for technology companies? Mm-hmm. That opens an interesting area. Uh, so SPACs are probably a good idea. The idea is you make this hollow company with nothing, and then when you find the right startup, you merge the two, and it becomes the technology company. And you don't have to then have an IPO and all the other roadshow stuff. So that's kind of neat. It's very efficient. But uh, you might notice that probably many of the fat SPACs are going down in value. It's, the IPO is nice because it makes you actually demonstrate a product, even if you're losing money. You go through a, a disclosure uh, process and so on. So I think that's a useful thing. The idea of being able to quickly uh, get something like that on the ground makes some sense, but you've got to use only savvy investors for it. Uh, for example, how many of you know that uh, Facebook, for example, you, you are, if you own Facebook, Meta, you own, you, you own part of the company, but you don't have any voting rights. They have two classes of stock. And so Zuck owns this chunk of stock, which is the voting stock, and his friends, and you own the vast majority of it, but you have no say in the company. I tend to like to avoid companies where there is no stockholder participation in the decision process because they tend to get ingrown and have real problems with uh, management. So I think I would be wary of companies that go with SPACs, wait for half a year or a year to see if anything develops. But I would also worry about companies that have this dual stock where the controlling interest in the company is elsewhere than with the stocks that you own. Okay, I think I'm going to close it off now. Thanks for sticking around till the end, and I'll be up here if you want to ask more questions. Thank you.